All right, welcome to A Growing Concern. I have a guest tonight, Sean Savage, who's going to talk a little bit about wealth inequality. And at first I was thinking wealth and inequality, and I realized he was saying wealth inequality. There's no and in it, because once you've got wealth, you've got inequality. And that's going to become really apparent as we go through the evening and we talk about this. Uh, Sean has a wealth of information about this. He's got some great graphs and, and, and uh, di different graphics that we can put up there and hope to make this. Well, it is a wonky subject, but it's going to be up to me to, to humanize it and make it more familiar to folks because as we try to, as we do on this program, we try to hook all the issues up together. And uh, I don't think that'll be difficult with this because wealth and poverty and the things that we're going to talk about is part of everybody's life. And uh, we might just learn a little bit tonight from Sean of why it is the way that it is. But welcome to the show, Sean. Oh, thank you, Jim. And I want to thank Frank Mahoney for putting this together for us. I guess you know Frank. And, uh, yeah, he that's said how you, we got hooked up. You might be an interesting person to, yeah. uh, to bring on the show. And uh, that's true. And this is, this is an issue that, like I say, we try to, try to talk about and connect everything up. Well, if, if, if there's any bottom line maybe beyond corporate dominance and control of what's going on in the economy in this world, it would be wealth and inequality. Wealth e inequality. Right, and th what I've done is, I'm a data guy. You know, I've got a um, degree, graduate degrees in engineering. You know, I've lived out, I've lived in Germany, Japan, and China. Um, I have taken economic classes. I've studied economics. I've accepted into grad school uh, business. So I have I've taken control theory, um, complexity theory, social dynamics, all these things that are required. As college courses, you mean? Well, no, through college courses and doing research in that area. Mm -hmm. So I have, you know, I'm a generalist. So instead of just saying, a Renaissance oh, man. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> sort of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I try to look at the full system. You know, I've been doing that since I was a young age. You know, I've been saying, why do things work? You know, why are they the way they are? You know, why are people doing things? Why are they doing things like that? You know, as a side note, I've studied ancient Chinese history, and that gives a beautiful example of the rise and fall of governments due to when a group of people get so large that the government is not fish efficient enough to manage it. And that's what's, that's the place that- You mean the um, population gets big enough. Yes, the population and the system gets large enough that the government can't control it. And that's one of the problems we're reaching today is in our world today, things are getting so complex and so interrelated and people are just start you know they no one can look at the whole picture so everyone's working on their own little part and what happens when one part breaks down mm -hmm. the system you know right but the system isn't isn't uh, governments and countries anymore it's it's the, it's the planet it's the planet you, you know it's it's the interactions between the governments and the corporations and the corporations with the people in multiple you know countries um, the trade you know it the, the complexity of this world is becoming so great that if one little thing breaks the human body is a complex thing right mm -hmm. but if your liver goes out, or you know, one thing breaks. What happens? The body dies, right? Either that, or you you're, you're homeless because you can't pay, <laughs> afford the bills. Yeah, the bills. I mean, on many on many different levels. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's the part of what's happening to the world today, is that it's becoming you know, to create efficiency, there has to be rules and regulations, and those rules and regulations cost money. Mm -hmm. And so, and they demand a certain amount of order, right? And so that's where complexity theory comes into how wealth inequality is starting. You know, is being used. 
you know, you mentioned the complexity of it. I had a conversation with a fellow in a coffee house the other day, right out, just out of the, out of the blue, about how all it would take was a gigantic solar flare to pretty much take civilization down by taking out all, a lot of these, these satellites. You're talking about complexity. One simple thing like that, you know? Uh, yes, yes. You know, a, a, if a nuclear bomb explodes over America, high energy electromagnetic pulse will be spread across America, mm -hmm. blowing out the communication system. That will take us back to the Stone Age. No one can use their cell phones anymore. <laughs> That's the complexity you're talking about, basically, is communication and connectedness. Yes, yes. And the rules and regulations to manage that. And, you know, the, the sh how many transports, huge transports are there in the world going between the nations? Trade. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying is what it takes to manage that you know, that's, that's what it is to, to manage it. But on the other one is to keep everything else down. That's where the inequality comes from. Well, what happens is, this is where sort of control theory comes in, is once you have money, you can use that money to change the rules to make more money. Mm -hmm. Like Oxfam says that 82% of all new wealth goes to the top 1% which means with the um, stock market, the stock market has gone up 30% since Trump gained office. Has, I'm talking to the audience. Have you seen any of that? I sure haven't. You know, the wealth, all the wealthy have seen them get richer, but no one else has. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Sure it has, and, and, and that's, by, that's by design. Yes, yes. And, you know, it's, the rich are no longer producing. They're, it's called rent-taking in economics, where they just say, okay, I have money, I build a house, you pay me for the house for the rest of your life. You know, mm -hmm. or, you know, people can't afford houses anymore. You have to rent and... For the rest of your life, you're paying someone for their wealth. Mm -hmm. And in fact, debt, and this is what is so amazing, is that the debt America has is owned by different countries and the rich. And we're paying rent to live in America, to, live in America. to the 1%. <laughs> I knew about that, but I never looked at it that way. I know Saudi Arabia, Japan, and China, I think, and England well, yeah, you know, own a we, great amount of it, this country. Yeah, and so what happens is that, and as the debt increases, there'll be a point in time where Americans are just working to pay off the debt and receive nothing back. So we're paying capital. We're mm. paying for the privilege of living in America. I bet Karl Marx is pissed. <laughs> <laughs> That's what his whole thing was about. I think well, was was a, was, a, was was the rising up of the proletariat, which Right, is, right. It, and you know, I, I disagree with Marx in some of the areas. Um, I consider, you know, I'm not a capitalist and I'm not a communist. Um, or I can say I'm a libertarian communist, you know, mm -hmm. because I have my own views. You know, I think the economy should be, is like a horse. You should lead it by the head. So if you can control the banks, then you can control the economy. If you can control the capital. I was just going to say the banks control the money. And that's why I, I, one of the, you know, later in the show, I'm going to talk about public nonprofit banks. So I, let's go to... Um, so it's been about 10 minutes, and you've got a series of, uh, slides? of slides, and we can get go. I think we got a pretty good beginning of where we're coming from here. Well, let's take a look at number one. And what this is, this slide is amazing. What I did is I took data from the Congressional Budget Office. This is a... Um, is this the one? This is the one. Okay. And that shows up real nice. I like that. Yeah. And so what I did is, you know, I, I, one of my things I do is machine learning and statistics and things. So, mm -hmm. 
Um, what this is, is this is a plot um, using polynomial regression to plot wealth in America. Um, you see the red line, see the stars? Those stars are the actual data points. Now, what are the triangles? Okay, the triangles just define the, the, um, the regression mm. line of, you know, the mathematical line of saying, this is the best fit of what's going to happen. It's a predictive line. Mm -hmm. And if you see the black dots near the blue line, that's the actual data. Okay? And as you can see, the red line is a top 10%. The blue line is the 50 to 90 percent. Mm -hmm. And see way down at the bottom, the black line? Mm -hmm. That's the bottom. Right. The black line is the bottom 50 percent of Americans. And as you can see, they have no wealth right now. Mm -hmm. So the probability is half of you watching this show, probably even more than that, because if you're home on a Friday night, you probably don't have any money to go out. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that um, black line represents 50% of, of the population. Of the population have no wealth. Well, from the looks like of the blue line, was it the red line? The, the, the blue, blue line, line it's pretty much down in the same place now. Well, by 2030, 90% of Americans will have no wealth. Now, how, is that, how is that predicted? Um, what I did is I took, you know, it's mathematics. I have data for 20 years or 30 so you years. Just, you just extrapolate from that? I just say, if this is what has happened, what will happen? Mm -hmm. You know, and using mathematics. Because it doesn't just go the same amount. It speeds up, slows down. Right. And that's what that, you know, if we can pull up one again, that's what... Get one back up, yeah. It, that's what... It shows is the rich are getting richer at a faster rate each year. Now, would your uh, he, he probably might get that back up in a second. Now, the rich that 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 uh, graph was graphic was for for the United States, obviously. Right. Now, would the one for the planet be would that um, be similar? Every every country is different, and let's go to no graph number two, the Gini coefficient. What we were looking at is wealth inequality. Now we're going to look at income inequality. So there's two different ways to look at I never, I never made a distinction. I see that. Yeah. You know, there's wealth, and wealth is your income accumulated over time. While right here, as you can see, um, the black dots are the data is the data, okay? And that blue line is a linear regression trying to plot where it's going. It looks like it's, it's kind of wavering on, on both sides of that line there. Right, right. So, so what it tries to do is it says, sometimes it's lower, sometimes it's higher, but let's try to find a single line that matches the best. Mm -hmm. And It's always approximate. It's approximate. Yeah. And as you can see, by 2021, it reaches 0.5%, 0.5. Now, how G, how, what the Gini coefficient is, is at zero, everyone has the same amount of money. At one, one person has all the money. Okay, that's how, what the Gini coefficient basically means. And this, there's a magic number at 0.5, because at 0.5, social unrest or revolution usually starts because the inequality gets so great that people start saying, screw this, you know. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, by 2021, following the plot, it will reach there. But you see that little extra sh line shooting up? That is Trump's tax breaks. So what that means is this summer... I, and because of this summer, I expect there will be social unrest. And by 2020, there will be definitely martial law in America.
Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's really sticking yourself out there. You know, I was thinking when you were talking now, do any of those figures predictive of the, uh, the Arab Spring a few years back when there was revolution there? Okay, that, that's a good point. Um, it's a completely it, different society. It's a completely different society. And they're still using the same economics. So even if we had, like right now, America's switching between red and blue leadership, right? Right, they don't have that issue over there. Then, cause, cause right, they and so changing colors doesn't help. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know they, they, it's still pretty bad. Yeah, but the st same people are really the ones pulling the strings, though. Right, right. And, it, it, you know, it, like the Waltons, six people in America have more wealth than 40% of Americans. The Waltons and people like uh, Warren Buffett. And, Warren uh, Buffett. And, and, and Bill Gates. Yeah. Okay, now if we look at number three, um, what we've done. This was a lot easier to read. <laughs> <laughs> the, top, yeah. the tax rate and the top 10% of the wealth. Okay, the red line is the top 10% of the wealth. Starting in 1913. And you can see there's a black line sort of on the left side. That was the Great Recession. So you see they lowered the tax rate very low. The, that shot, the top 10% wealth shot up dramatically, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> and, you know, the great crash came. And then they raised taxes. Okay, you can see the 1940. What that is, is that is World War II. And you can see the wealth took a, the top 10% took a big hit there. And the 50s, and uh, it was uh, fairly high. And in 1960, notice how they lowered it to about uh, 70%, right? It, it was at 91% taxes at one time. I was just reading about that the other day. Yeah, everything, okay. was, everything was going great in this country then. Yeah, and you know, in the 50s and 60s, we, the rich were getting taxed very high and things were going great, okay? Then, see the first bit sort of gray area? That is Reagan I just, and I Bush. That's what I was gonna say, Reagan. And so the, it looks like that red line goes down to the very bottom uh, during the Reagan years. Now, does that mean that uh, the top 10% were earning the smallest amount? At that time, yes. At that yes. time. And, um, and they said, well, we, we can't have this. And if, if you look at the 50%, the 50% owned more, and I didn't make a slide on this, but, yeah, um, but at that, 1986 was a defining year where the rich started getting richer, and the poor started getting poorer. Um, and then the second gray area is the Bush's tax cut. And look what happens to the rich there. Look how the top 10% was making money hand over foot. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now if we go to number four, what this is, is this is the U.S. government debt. And this is going to start getting wonky to some people because I know it does to me. Yeah. The, the relationship between debt and taxes and all that. Right. But and you'll see during the Reagan era, you know, before Reagan, debt was, there was debt during World War I. There was debt during World War II. There was debt during the Reconstruction after the Great Recession. But debt was fairly low. But... Reagan basically says, let's spend and let's reduce taxes and borrow money. Now, the interesting thing about this is when the U.S. borrows money, it sells bonds, right? Mm -hmm. And it says, okay, um, we'll pay you back later with interest. Well, the rich people can buy the bonds. So the more debt there is, the more money 
the rich make off of America. Right, but it, those, those bonds don't give them a whole lot of uh, return. Um, well, you have uh, $100 million of them that oh, do. Yeah, I guess you're right there, you bet. <laughs> okay, as you can I see, see um, the red is like the World War of 1812, the Civil War, World War I, the Great Depression. What is, Wait, the, what is the difference in width, just in, over time? Um, yeah, th that's, that's, the, that's the, when, the rising debt, okay? That's when debt rose the most. So, oh, I see. Okay, I got and it. And you can see, starting in 1980, what happens to the debt? That's the second to the last red. It takes off, right? Mm hmm Okay. And then in 19, and then in 24, you know, once Bush got back into office, what happens to the debt? You know, Bush baby, W. W. The debt just skyrocketed. And you can see that in 2007, because of the great recession with the oh, housing market, right. I mean, the debt just skyrocketed. And all that debt is owned by not, you know, the rich and other countries. Other countries. So we've, we've sold off most of America already. I can remember, I forget what it was. I think that uh, the peso was worth like 2,300 pesos to a dollar. And we bolstered their economy but we had to borrow money to do that. Yeah. So in order to, to borrow that money, we were having to pay an incredible amount of interest in order to, in order to help another country, which I'm not yeah. saying we shouldn't have done it. But that's when I realized that all this money that we spend, we are actually incurring debt that is going to be going through time down to our children and grandchildren. Right. A and, and it's never going to end. It's never going to end. Um, let's roll a clip. This is, <clears throat> this is a, one of my favorite clips. Um, it stars um, Keith Sutherland. Oh, yeah. Um, 24 fame. Yeah, and um, um, uh, spaced his name. Um, uh, it's, it's Flashback. The movie called, is called Flashback. All right, we'll get into that. It's about a minute or so, isn't it? Something like yeah, yeah, a minute so like that. And it basically shows what happened to the poor and the rich in America. And so Reagan basically started the predicament we're in now. Mm -hmm. All right, hopefully they'll get that. I've been reading the newspaper though, however. How about this? Reagan is writing a book on his eight years in Washington. How do you uh, explain his sudden interest in politics, huh? It's a cheap shot. He's done a great deal for this country. Well, name one thing. He turned the economy around. Yeah. Now we got two classes. The truly needy and the truly greedy. Very funny. I don't think so. We got poor people living in the street, man. And the rich, they're living at the Betty Ford Center. Going good, yeah. <laughs> So the extreme needy and extreme greedy. greedy, which, you know, brings up the point that that uh, the middle class is disappearing. Exactly. And that's what the that's what chart number one showed is that the middle class, the 40 to 50, per, the 40 to 90 percent will disappear. It's being hollowed out. Yes. Um, now, I've talked gloom and doom all this time, right? Yeah, for 24 minutes. Yeah. 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 Well, but isn't that isn't all there is to it? There right? isn't. For me, as a systems engineer, I, I want to basically take America back. Okay, but how can you do that? There's so much money. If we can show that's interesting. Seven. That's how Trump got elected was to make America great again, take right. it back. Right. And but that's not what he's doing. No, though, obviously. <laughs> no. And so. There we go. Yeah. Is that the right one? No, but what this does is this shows you how social, what, how wealth inequality affects health. America has the worst health in the world almost mm -hmm. in the, for the developed countries because the wealth inequality is so great. 
So no, he, he took it back down. And, seven? Uh, number seven is the one we want. Well, you know, what you're saying is true, not to digress much, but while he's getting this to go up there, our diet's got a lot to do with it. And what we've done to our environment has a lot to do with it, too. Oh, yes, yes. You know, um, it's a package. <laughs> economic stress, financial stress is a constant stress. It raises cortisol hormone in your body. Mm -hmm. And that's very destructive for your body. And that's what the whole problem with wealth inequality. As the rich get richer, the rest of us have less and less per capita. Mm -hmm. And what happens is people start flipping out. Gun violence is due to that's a good connection. Yeah. You know, as people get more stressed, there's more gun violence. You know. Yeah, and as they get more stressed, they, you know, they end up missing more work or whatever. And it, it just keeps making it worse. <laughs> He's having issues getting the right one. Is this the one? It's yes, nice, this, this is it. Nice, colorful one. Okay, Go on, Frank. <laughs> okay, we need to talk, leave this up and talk about it for a while. Yeah, it's, okay? it's pretty busy. There's a lot going on okay. there. Okay, see the red at the top? Okay. Uh -huh. With the dollar what, signs in with it? With the dollar signs. You know, $6 billion, over $6 billion was spent at the last federal election. Every year, lobbyists spend $4 billion in lobbying. You and I, the 50% don't have the wealth to spend in politics. Even right? if we could all get together. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so... There is so much wealth between us and the government. So I said, how do we, we get around this? And with alt facts and fake news, you know, what, what, how can we do this at a, you know, we can't change, you know, changing the constitution would be a real pain, right? So what I said is, let's, uh, okay, um, ticker two, okay, so, Let's find, let's, I created a program that allows you to adjust the budget to what you want. So if you've got, um, if you want, I'm a disabled veteran. So if I have, everyone gets one tax dollar. And if I put 10 cents and it's a proportional representation of the discretionary budget. So if I put 10 cents of my tax dollar to Department of Veterans Affairs, I'm voting for 10% of the discretionary budget to go to Department of Veterans Affairs. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it's, it's simple math, right? Everyone gets one tax dollar and they could divide it up in a billion ways. Okay? And so then what it does is it creates a form and it goes from the person to hard data. Okay? You've got data that's hard you know no one could argue about it it's what you want to spend your money on mm -hmm. it, that goes to the irs and i picked the irs because no one will file their taxes twice so no one will vote twice right <laughs> <laughs> that's right they certainly wouldn't pay them twice. and the, and anything to do with money the government pays a lot of attention to mm -hmm. So the IRS gets it, anonymizes it, and gives it to the Census Bureau. But here's the cool thing. You get a receipt back, that's a cryptographic receipt, that now allows you to go into the Census Bureau database and verify your vote. Mm -hmm. So there it is. So you're talking about there's somewhere somebody can go and do this? Yeah, all it takes is it's a, it's a regulatory change. It's a new tax form. Oh, so you're saying it's 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 uh, a, com a completely new uh, way of of uh, paying taxes. No, no, no. You still pay your taxes. This is just an extra form you can file. Oh, okay. And it basically says I want my tax money to go to these things. Instead of the large amount going to the uh, well, arms manufacturers, you want to put it somewhere. You want to put it somewhere else. Or, or, you know, it, one of the things if people don't like abortion, they can say, "No money for abortions." Boom. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's their vote. And any thing that has abortions in it, or some people don't want to the military. 
Then at the end of the tax season, it's aggregated. Put all together, everything's added up. And average it out. Average, you know, sent to the con Congressional Budget Office and a people's budget is created and given to Congress. They can choose to ignore this. And you know, if people in the um, audience watching TV want to comment on this, this would be cool. You know, and so there's the people's budget that's submitted to Congress. Mm -hmm. They can choose to ignore it, right? And you know they would probably, oh, at least yes. for the first year. For the first year, mm -hmm. right. But the thing is, it's hard data, right? Now you have a hard measuring stick at the next election. Mm -hmm. So, hey, this is what the people wanted. Why didn't you vote for this? It's okay. kind of a real hard data poll is what you're saying. Right. Yeah. Basically, and it happens every year. Mm -hmm. Okay. And another interesting thing is um, uh, there's templates. You know, God, the budget's complex. Okay. I don't want to look at it. Okay. It's horrible. Well, I want to use this template. Okay, and so what organizations will offer templates that you can use, say, use our budget, okay? This is what we think the budget should be. So that would be, you know, for health care and with... Or and, like and, Republicans, and Democrats, Greens, right. your church group. But they would have a pie with, with different segments for different... Different, the amount, different amounts for different... And this goes through, you know, the software goes three levels deep. Mm -hmm. You know, it gets really detailed. So you're talking about the ones I've actually seen on Facebook because there'll be a there'll be a pie and like two thirds of it or over half of it at least is is uh, defense. Yeah, and I think that's where a lot of people would weigh in on, on to do something about that. Well, okay, in Port in Oregon, yes, but in Alabama, no, because Alabama has a lot of lot of money, a lot of employment, et cetera, going to to the it, defense or Virginia industry. or Virginia. Virginia, especially. yeah, yeah, so. And the thing is with tax and vote, it doesn't say how you should vote. It just gives people a voice. Does mm -hmm. that, you know, if you want more uh, military spending, by goodness, you get to vote for it. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and every state if has you don't some wanna, money going to the arms manufacturers. Yeah, and, and, and if you don't want to fund um, the EPA, don't fund it. If you want to fund the EPA, Fund it. Or, plan, or Planned Parenthood. Or Planned Parenthood. I'm not saying how you should vote. This is just the way you can vote. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a system of devising your priorities. Right. It, and when people, when the organizations are advertising their um, templates, they're also educating the people on the budget. Mm -hmm. So now we have a more educated populace. You know, use our, use our template because we put more money into the military. Or use our template because we don't put as much military. Mm -hmm. You know, use ours because we give veterans more. You know, so what will happen is people will understand the budget more. So it's an educational process, mm -hmm. too. And also the dynamics of the relationship between the different departments or whatever they get that money. Right. And... You know, and because it's a federal department, there's really no advertising for that department. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the only ones advertising are the organizations who want you to use their template. And they're not saying, vote for us because we make you look good. It says, vote for us because one, two, three, four, five in the budget. Mm -hmm. You know, so and it would it would it would probably make people understand a little bit more like, you know, a large amount of money goes maybe to the Justice Department. Now, does that go to the FBI and the different places? It would break it down a little bit so people understand where that money is going. And, and that's what the, the that's software, what we need to know. The, the software does do that. Yeah. And if we can pull up the website tax and vote, I can show you a couple things on that. All right. Um, and so the. Some interesting things about um, tax and vote is it gets rid of gerrymandering mm -hmm. because everyone has a vote. A blue person in a red state or a red person in a blue state now really doesn't have a vote, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know, they're overswamped by the other color, right? What this does is 
Everyone has one tax dollar. Every person. And because it can only be filed with the 1040, that means corporations don't have this. Right. And I was just I was just going to say that since since uh, a lot of corporations don't pay any taxes. But then again, as you say, they 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 don't wouldn't get one because they're not a person, even and, though the Supreme Court says they are. Right. And so, um, you know, and I've got if I had my graph, I could pull it. You know, I, I, there are graphs that show how corporate tax rates have been going down. You know, so we, I, we did a program on that here when they were trying to get that corporate tax rate changed here in the in the in the, in Oregon, and it didn't go through because fear mongering basically is what usually happens. That was a while yeah. back. Yeah, and you know, as for corporate taxes, what I think would be the ideal solution is they should be ta their tax rate should be profit per employee. So what mm. this means is companies, some companies make a million dollars per employee of profit. And I'm saying, huh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, why don't, they should be taxed very high because they're, you know, corporations are supposed to be supplying a service and employment, right? Mm -hmm. So if the tax rate was based on profit per employee, you know, a company could be barely squeaking by and they pay no taxes. Mm -hmm. You know, right now, big windfalls are being given out to, like a few years ago, some company came to Gresham and they gave them, you know, six million dollar, you know, special deal. They stayed there 10 years and now they're gone. Yeah, I remember the one, it's an enormous campus out there on yeah. off Stark, I think. Yeah, and, and now they're gone. But if we look at tax and vote, I can show you sort of what, you know, I'm talking about with the budget. Well, I know what, I know what you're website. saying because that surplus now is being eaten up by incredible uh, uh, wages or when I guess salaries being paid to the CEOs and the bonuses. Million dollar bonuses. I think we have a phone call before we get to that. Okay. Uh, uh, first caller, you're on the air. Did we light Hello. a fire? Hey, did we light a fire? Are you there? We yes. are. Yes. Uh, fascinating program. Good numbers, good charts. Happy messenger of great doom sitting to your right, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're getting but to how I, we can fix it, though. Yeah. I'm curious because this program's only an hour long. Yeah, right. <laughs> if 2020 is when the middle class has disappeared and essentially nobody has wealth but the top 10%. 2030. 2030, okay. I'm, I, I'm trying to live long enough to see what happens, but I'm curious. Uh, I mean, I, I think you're right about social unrest this summer. I think ever since Occupy, we've been in a state of pretty serious agitation with mm -hmm. Black Lives Man Matter and Dreamers and Me Too mm -hmm. and now the no Never Again. And, and the Dapple. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. So um, I, I'm curious if we just have a few years before the fit hits the Shan, yeah. <laughs> uh, shouldn't we be focusing on making sure that people understand who their friends are and what the problem is, and how to get there uh, as w with as little bloodshed as possible, not only on a local level, but globally. I mean, I, I think it's so imperative that the left step up and start putting out a coherent narrative that not only lets all the people who already agree with them be able to spread that message, but begins to make inroads into the people who have been totally brainwashed, all those people out there. I agree there who, with you. I agree yeah. with you. Yeah. And that's sort of what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, with tax and vote, I'm trying to give people a larger voice in Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's sort of what I'm trying to do is when, and also an interesting thing, it separates the fiscal from the moral. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is with tax and vote, it... You know, if, if tax and vote does get into effect, what will happen is I expect more money will go to social programs. You know, from what I have seen 
and the studies I've done, more will go to social programs. And so that will sort of delay it. But what it also does is it takes, this is true fiscal democracy. And every year people vote and say, I want my money spent on this. And so what it does is it gives a very good start to prevent the, the revolution. In fact, this is my sign. When injustices law, revolution is necessary. Taxation with representation. And what this means is this is a nonviolent revolution. This is a revolution that ch fundamentally changes the system, right? Without destroying it. Without destroying it. <laughs> yeah. In fact, tax was... compliance will probably go up with this <laughs> tax and vote. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. You know. I think Kennedy said something along those lines. You know, so I am trying, this solution is a positive solution that gives people a voice that doesn't take money. It bypasses the money. It's hard data, so not alt facts or fake news. So it's a way to really let the government know what's on the mind of the people every year. So is the caller still there? He's probably taking yeah. the rest. Oh, you there? I, I, I'm here. I like what you're saying. I think it gets us part of the way there. But I, was it Pretty Boy Floyd that somebody asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's where the money is. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was Dillinger. I don't oh, remember. One of those but, folks, yeah. Well, we need to get word out where the money is in this economy. And the notion that that money doesn't have to be reinvested into the people who generated the, the, the wealth that created it to start with and the land that, from which it was ripped, which belongs to all of us, and every other hideous thing they've done to the planet in order to make lots of money. Mm -hmm. That's where the money is, folks. Yes, and... We have to go get it. Um, well, that's, you, you are correct. Um, and like in the, in the thing that shows that by 2030, 90% of Americans will have no wealth, I'm expecting social unrest to deal with that. And... Um, so that's, you know, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build a basis for a economy, for a system by which people can really have a voice and that what they say can't be interpreted. You know, the group of people says this is what we want. Money. Can't, I'm trying to pull money out of politics. Notice that there's really no money in the, this uh, uh, um, feedback system. And here I'm using control theory, right? Mm -hmm. I've added a new feedback system to the government that does not take money. So what I'm trying to do is pull the money out of politics in my own way. So how would you suggest doing it? There would be this, this thing that you're talking about that people would fill out to send in with their with right. their with it's, their it's tax, just another piece of paper. With their tax returns? Yeah, it's just another piece of paper with computer sure. codes about, on it that how about all the people that don't earn enough to pay taxes? They can send one in that if they, they can want. Just send it in on their own. Yeah. You know, and you could even hand write, you know, I'm what I'm envisioning is that you can go to the library, fill it out, and get a form, yeah, and print it out at the library, and there it is. So well, people can be doing this even without the government sponsoring it. Not that it would do any good, right? Right. But it could prime the pump a little bit, right? And so you know, one of the things here is um, I have approached Wyden with this and Bonici, and. You know, they said, you know. A lot of reasons why we can't do it. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so, because they have a vested interest in um, maintaining the status quo. You know, and so this is just one of my ideas on how to, first of all, this basically starts taking money out of politics. 
And it gives and people a voice too. And, yes, and it's it's a feed, it's a it adds a feed a new feedback system to the government. And in control theory, when you add a new feedback system, the system changes. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Is the caller still there? We might only have one line, so we might have to free this yeah, up. Yeah. But if you're still there, do you have any more comment? No. Nope. Apparently not. So the, the, the line's up now because we used to have two lines, but I think we're just down to one now. So and, and uh, so I had some somewhere to go with all this, but but the, yeah, I had no idea exactly what your tax and vote is or was when we, when we talked about this on the phone. I figured I would be finding out tonight, and I am. And it's a, and uh, you you've been working out the details of this for some time, I think. Right, right. My market research, I've got a something like an eighty-five percent across the board, both right and left. In fact. Um, there was an anti-fa rally, and the prayer keepers were there. The, you know, the oh, the, the promise keepers, promise keepers, yeah. the very right wing. And I ask the promise keepers, do you think would you when you file your taxes, would you like to vote how your tax dollar is spent? Mm -hmm. They said yes. I bet they did. <laughs> and I asked anti-fa, when you file your taxes, would you like to vote? how your tax dollar is spent. They said yes. Oh my God, I've got something both agree From, on. <laughs> and you, you're talking both extremes at that point. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why I'm thinking that, you know, like I said, this is apolitical. You know, mm -hmm. all I'm trying to do is change the system, add another feedback system, feedback mechanism from the people that does not take money. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with what you're saying, and I can understand, though, that there's going to be there, there, the main problem I can think about it is is the atmosphere in this country of uh, the left and the right are so polarized against one, one another that the people in the South who are the staunchest haters of socialism are also the ones that receive the most. And you would think that they would be the ones who would probably vote for more of their money to go into social services. But at the same time, they have somehow been hoodwinked into thinking that that socialism is is communism and it's it's terrible. So there's 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 so much confusion going on right now over values. Well, part of that is. Because, you know, they, they love the concept of being able to vote with their taxes. But part of that is the Republicans have done a wonderful job of combining moral decisions with financial decisions mm -hmm. okay and what this does is separates the two so what i would expect to see and what the research supports is that you'll start to get the strong you know the whole concept of moral and financial once split apart like the libertarians do that right now mm -hmm. where in a libertarian, there are two axes. There's a social and a fiscal. And I was a libertarian. I ran for secretary of state in 1992 for the Libertarian Party. Mm -hmm. So I believe in small government, but I also believe in justice and social programs, you know, mm -hmm. support for the people, you know. And that's where, you know, I my difference is you know is so one of the things you know if we can show the tax and vote website if there's some pretty cool stuff on it i'm pretty proud of it i programmed it myself all right we can get that up here we can take that off of there you know when you're talking about separating the moral from the financial the first thing that popped into my mind was the uh the moral vote that wants to take out planned parenthood right that needs to be separated. Oh, is this what you're looking at yes, here? Yes, yes. So if we can click on vote with your tax dollar up at the top, scroll so down. Can we do that? Can you? Oh, all right, we can do that. And this requires 3D and there's my bug. <laughs> okay, if you want, as you see, you hover over it. And if you use a scroll wheel in and out, you can see that it expands and contracts. And if you uh, put the mouse down, 
um, you then can rotate that. Wow. And let's put it on its side, okay? Like that. What does that look like, okay? But let's have the long pull up, okay? Long pull up. Right there. Like you that. go. There, yeah. That's a good, that's a total profile there, right? Right. What do you think that t tallest thing is? Uh, I'd say uh, top 1% wealth, maybe? No, that's oh. military defense spending. Oh, well, yeah. That's, Compared that's, to everything else. That's my favorite uh, problem, is that. Okay. Is that. And if look at the logo on tax and vote. Where would that be? Um, see, at the top. See, oh, uh, yes, it's the same thing, yeah. But what else does it look like? <laughs> <laughs> it shows that we're getting screwed. <laughs> So, you know, I, I like to play, you know, well, I've got yeah, a little sense of Imagery is important, you know, and yeah. especially if they come to that conclusion on their own. Yeah. And like you say, so many people, I never thought about it, but so many people would vote for a high military budget because the uh, defense industry is, has so many jobs and they're throwing so much money into the, into the legislators that to, to, get, to, get, ah, but to get that to change would take a grassroots effort like you're talking right. about. Right. And the thing is, like I'm saying is, it's not me telling them people how to vote. I am just creating a way that people's voice can be heard without giving money. Giving them a megaphone. Without money, mm -hmm. okay? I, I, I wanted something that, and the, you know, I can give you details where all the data can fit on to eight terabytes. Um, it takes about two hours on my home computer to process the uh, 265 million records. So, you That's know, a lot of terabytes. No, no, no it's, it's really pretty small. You know, it's four hundred dollars worth of hard disks. Oh, well, these days, yeah. these days. And so I've designed the whole system to, to be very low cost and very affordable. It's open source. So it's not me saying I've got this program. And I'm going to keep it and sell it to you. No, it's Linux. No, it, it, it's it's a Web page, ah. web application. I see. And we're starting to get off right about where I'm going to lose track of what you're saying right, there. You know, because, but there's a lot of folks out there that really understand this a whole lot better than I do. And as far as the technical aspects of it, like that website where you had that, that uh, interactive. And that, that's really great because I, I think a lot of people would understand exactly what to do there. Right, right. And there's a tree on the other side. And due to my testing, it didn't show up. But <laughs> that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's it, like everything else, technology is always technology in progress or in process. Right. Now, you know, there's some other ideas I like to discuss. Like, and I discuss we got five this, minutes. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, you know, like machine learning and artificial intelligence are going to be owned by businesses. Right? I was just reading how China is going to be in 10 years. They're going to be the leaders. Oh, yes. Yes. And that's... And then there'll be artificial intelligent wars in cyberspace, in trade. You know, companies are already using machine learning and artificial intelligence in um, maximizing profits. And pretty soon there'll be two... You know, if you've got two companies using artificial intelligence against each other, people are sort of becoming pawns and saying, mm -hmm. you know, the machine knows best. Isn't that loosely what happened in our last election? Maybe it wasn't, in, uh, it was machine intelligence. It was using machines to influence. That's, that yeah, yeah. is a very, very grassroots exactly. thing of what you're yeah, talking yeah. about. Yeah, you're talking about Facebook's... Um, the bots. The bots programming and sending, reamplifying the messages they want to be amplified. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that was very basic machine learning. And that you've basically, that saw the first part of what's going to happen with machine learning. And you know, is, I'm into that. And this you know, is that's between countries do. there, but we're talking about between, corporations between businesses. and also countries, okay? And the local people will just become pawns and the corporations will use it to maximize the profit. I've often said on this show that World War III is already underway and it's between the corporations and democracy. And, and that's exactly kind of what you're talking about. And democracy is just kind of like out of the picture in what you're well, saying there. One of, one of the, 
Plato, when he wrote The Republic, basically said, democ he didn't like democracy, because he said democracy has two options. It either goes into anarchy or tyranny. And that's sort of where this country's headed. If to save the country, we'd have to go into a tyranny police state. Also, I've talked about another big thing I wanted to bring up is uh, nonprofit public banks. Don't have a whole lot of time. I wish we had more time for this. I know that there is a, uh, the state of North Dakota has a right. bank like that. And, and if every state had a nonprofit public bank that managed that state's finances, what that does is then that state, the people in that state, not the government of that state, but the people in that state would then suggest how to use the resources of that state for the betterment of the state, not just throwing it all up to uh, Wall Street and having them take it from us. Exactly right. Uh, we've talked about this on the program before, and uh, uh, I know that uh, David Delk, who does the Populist Dialogues, has done programming on this programming on this before. And it it would it would I don't know if it would cut Wall Street off at the knees, but it certainly would stub their toe. Yes. it would take a lot of their power away. Right. And, and this is the type of thing that I I want to give the pe power back to the people. To me, that's important. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, you know, financial control is more, greater. You know, I say that basically Wall Street runs America. The government manages it. Mm -hmm. Because what's in your po the money in your pocket is more important to you than some person voting on something about 3,000 miles away, unless it directly affects you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right now the dreamers, yes. You know, there, there are some key issues, but in general, most of what Washington does is manage people. Mm -hmm. You know, what you're saying about, about the, the, the country going to either anarchy or tyranny, well, this isn't just uh, something here in this country. You start seeing about the Brexit, you start seeing about these different countries that are starting to become more and more, you know, uh, fascist or right wing, as well as it just happened with with uh, with and in this country, this is going on all over the Brazil world. Brazil has just introduced military into civilians uh, because their their inequality is higher than America's, and in order to maintain control, the military is now roaming the streets of Brazil. And we've been hearing a lot about about Honduras and a lot of other yeah. places where the Huntas, or the Huntas, I guess is how they pronounce that, is taken over. Well, we're down to 30, 30 seconds. seconds. I'll yeah. let you finish up. <laughs> All right, there isn't much left to finish up here. I, I want to thank the crew for uh, putting this together for us. It's a little bit more complicated than usual. I want to thank Frank for getting this great guests. Thank and, you, and Frank. I want to thank the guest and the phone call. I want to forget the phone call. That fell out. He brought a little bit of... Uh, uh, dimension about how this is being received out there. And like I've said before, we're uh, every other week now, so we'll be back on the uh, 16th. And uh, thanks all for tuning in. Uh, I hope we made answered some questions and created some questions tonight. Good night.